A married woman received some bad news. Her husband had been in a horrible automobile accident and was brain dead. So the doctor told her that there was some good news though. They had perfected the brain transplant technique and she was fortunate because there were three fresh brains in the bank from which to choose from. Apparently there had been a large explosion that had killed a firefighter, a captain and a chief. Having insurance, she requested the cost for each brain. The firefighter's brain was $10,000, the captain's was fifty, dollars and the chief's was a million dollars. Curious, she asked why the chief's brain was so much more expensive. Because it's never been used, replied the doctor. <laughs> Okay, uh, we got another quick one here. Firemen and policemen die and they both go to heaven. And when they're issued wings, they're warned that if they have even one bad thought, their wings will fall off. Everything was going great and sometime later, an attractive young lady passed by. As the fireman turned to look, his wings fell off. Shortly after, when he bent over to pick them up, the policeman's wings fell off. <laughs> So over the past half century, among other endeavors in our community, we've joined the fight with other departments across Canada to fight against muscular dystrophy. With our annual boot drive, with the combined efforts of fire departments across this country, we've raised over $75 million since 1954. Muscular dystrophy is the name... Muscular dystrophy is a group of neurological or neuromuscular disorders which are characterized by progressive weakness and wasting of voluntary muscles that control body movement. As the muscle tissue weakens and wastes away, it is replaced by fatty connective tissue. Muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder which can be passed on from generation to generation. Contrary to popular belief though, muscular dystrophy is not exclusively a childhood disorder and anyone can be affected by it. While some types of muscular dystrophy are first evident in infancy or early childhood, other types manifest later on in life. Over time, the person with the neuro neuromuscular disorders may lose the ability to walk, speak, and ultimately breathe. And for some individuals, the disorder is fatal and there is no cure currently for it. Our small community's donations have been very important and have made our department punch well above its weight when it comes to what we deliver to MD Canada every year in support of this worthy cause. And I would like to take a moment on behalf of the Chetwin Volunteer Fire Department to thank all those who've supported us in the past and who will again in the future. Uh, Lucas Stewart, can you come up to the podium please? Yeah, uh, Chris kind of covered most of it there um, about what MD is and what we do as firefighters to help support them. You guys have all seen us out uh, shaking the boot on the highways and gathering money for Muscular Dystrophy Canada. And it's kind of been the charity of choice for fire departments in North America, as he said, since 1954. And uh, as a communal fire service, we've pledged our support until a cure is found. And uh, Randy Walker and myself just had the pleasure of going down to the Muscular Dystrophy Conference in Vancouver last weekend. And there we were able to hear from some leading researchers and doctors in the field, as well as many people that uh, benefit from the funds raised by muscular dystrophy. And it really seems that we may have a cure within grasp. It's, it's, it's close. They're, they're making some huge leaps and, and strides in the, in the field. And as long as we can continue to support them for the next, you know, several years, it really seems like they might have a, an actual cure, which is outstanding news and, and obviously very exciting news. And it's all thanks to everybody like yourselves that have donated to our boot drives, to things like tonight and our raffles, uh, and all the people that donate to support Mustard Dystrophy. Uh, a couple extra numbers for you is that um, nationwide, firefighters provide 31% of all the funds that go towards Mustard Dystrophy, 
and then BC that's 38%, and that's the largest single contributor of funds to muscular dystrophy, is all from firefighters and our boot drives, which really means the communities that support the firefighters to help fight muscular dystrophy. So uh, on that note, tonight we're doing a couple raffles. In addition to all our door prizes, uh, which will be talked about later on, those you have to be here to claim. If you're not here, they, they pull the next name. Uh, but we're doing a raffle tonight, and if you buy a ticket and you're not here, we will post the winning number in the paper uh, and on the radio, so not to worry if you're not here. Uh, but we have a, a wonderful basket of uh, drinks and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, lots of fun stuff in the basket donated by High Sky Enterprises, as well as a beautiful handmade quilt. If you all look over here to the far wall, there's a beautiful handmade quilt by Teresa Walker. She did the quilting and her friend Regine Doucette did the uh, long arm stitching for it. And it's actually about double the size you see. A lot of it's hanging over the other side, but it's a beautiful handmade quilt with a little, uh, yeah. So that's very generous of Teresa and Dennis to have donated that for the second time this year, actually. Uh, so if you want, there are $2 a ticket, and we're going to be doing a raffle later on, and you can decide whether your chances go for the basket or the quilt or any combination thereof, and all your support is appreciated. And again, it all goes to Muscular History. So thank you all for your support for, for Muscular History Canada. Thank you very much, Luke, and thank you for all your hard work over the past couple of years for that in our community. I just got one last quick joke. i got to tell this because I might not get to the others. A bad firefighter dies, goes to hell, and he finds a wall of clocks. So after seeing all the clocks on the wall with his friend's names underneath him, he asks the devil, well, what do these clocks mean? Well, that's easy. Each time one of your friends messes up on earth, the clock speeds up by one hour, says the devil. Well, I don't see the chief's clock here, the fireman says. Uh, well, we've got that one down in the basement. We're using it for a fan. <laughs> Can... Uh, Chief Sobolski and Mayor Nichols, please come up to the podium for the presentation of the Long-Term Service Awards. Leo says he's got nothing to say. Would I talk for a couple of minutes while he go gets, goes to get the prizes? Uh, but he's a fast walker. He's not going to take him that long. Five years to Mike Kozak and they're not here. They're working both of them. So five years service. Does that mean you guys? Yeah. Just waiting for the applause. <laughs> How long is five years? How many days is five years? Come on. Quick. Okay, let me say it this way. How many years is five years? You got that one, five. We have two five-year service awards to be presented tonight. It is unfortunate or sad or the reality that the recipients of these two five-year five -year awards are really dedicated people. They're working tonight. And they're not here to receive them. However, I can read their names. Ian Martin, give them a hand. And Mike Kozak. And you can pass the word on the next time you see Ian and Mike that they have these five-year service awards and Leo is going to give them to him somewhere, somehow, sometime, someplace. And now we have 15 years, they're here, and they're here. both Ben, Brent and Ben. No. So if five years is five years, how long is 15 years? Come on, you should don't know your arithmetic that well. It's three times five. Anyway, 
we have two 15 years, 15 years is a long time no matter how you count it, 15 years of volunteer services, I don't know if it's long or short, but it's great to have 15 years of service. And so we have Brent Weisgerber. I know you're sitting over there somewhere, Brent. Come up and get your award. And we also have Ben Bolak. 15 years for Ben as well. Come on over here where I can shake your hand. Thank you very much. I feel honored to shake your hand. 15 years is but a blink. Long time when you're waiting to get into the bar. Short time when you're doing that. <laughs> Come on up, Ben. Congratulations. Is 15 years a long time, Ben? Yeah, and the older you get, the faster it goes. Yeah, that's for true. <laughs> hey, did you all hear what Ben just said? The older you get, the faster it goes. Do you know why that is? It's true. It's absolutely true, and we can show it mathematically. The older you get, the faster the years go. You know, when you were one year old, one year was 100% of your lifetime. You know that. You can grasp that. When you're 50 years old, one year is only 2% of your lifetime. And when you get to be 100, you see, it's shorter than ever. So Ben's right, the older you get, the faster it goes. Thank you very much, that was inspiring. We have something inspiring right now. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the people that have been working on this and you'll be seeing them later today. Um, and I don't see where she went. Oh yes, right in front of me. Becky uh, and Andy from uh, Chet TV, can you put your hands in the air please? And Trevor is also on TV, but his primary job is his PD with Radio Peace FM. What we've done uh, for the 50th anniversary of the Firefighters Ball is they've spoken to people that were at the first Firefighters Ball. So this is very unique. <laughs> chat when I believe when our family moved here around 57, 58. I think I was only about six years old so I don't really remember those first days but there was many stories over the years that was a fond memory of mom and dad. I came out here first in 1952 on the survey uh, on the Hart Highway with the Beattie brothers, Frank Campbell and Bud Browns and so on. I went to the Chetland Fire Department, and uh, we made it ourselves. Well, Chetland was there just there's about 29 people here. It's about, I think, the, it was the crowd that was here. I met Joe when I joined the fire department in 1962. And uh, we were together on the fire department for quite a few years and done a lot of traveling together. And the old uh, Murray's Pub fire truck, when Joe brought it down, I went to Prince George with a set of chains to, because it was glare ice in the pass and give him a hand to get back to Chetwin with it. It, uh, yeah, it, uh, we used to do a lot of skidooing together and lots of fun. <laughs> My dad actually was Chetwin's first fire chief many years ago. I think back as far as 1958. So your husband was a fireman? Or was well, he was one of the firemen, yeah. Yeah? How he was that? A, he was just a, he wasn't a a chief or anything like that, but I mean, he won ever since, ever, ever then there. Mm -hmm. Were you ever afraid that he might get in trouble or hurt himself? Or 
Uh, not too, a little bit, not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, well, that's the first thing that happens to you when you come to town. Uh, <clears throat> Roger St. Dennis was fire chief at the time, and uh, of course you're asked to join, so you join and uh, it was great. It was everybody that was, really everybody that was here that was... Uh, well, they were friends as well as um, they both all a lot of them worked at the sawmill at that time, and they're just good friends, and we all sort of formed a circle, I guess you'd call it. Yeah, well, this is Clay Collins, one of the firemen, uh, back when, when I was in the department. I, he was there for quite a few years. And this is the loaner fire truck from the uh, uh, fire marshal's office we had when the fire hall burnt down one of the trucks and of course the old Murray's pub fire truck as well this is just one of the fire trucks in Kamloops when we were down there curling and here we have a picture of us down curling there's myself Roger St. Dennis Joe Embry and John Leckaby the Chetwin Fireettes. If I remember correctly, BC Tell would get the initial call. They would call whoever was the one to get a hold of at the time, and then that person would call the rest of the wives, and they would get their husbands up and out the door. Well, it, the call-out system was, if it wasn't for the Fireettes, uh, that's all we had is the phones, eh? And if you were busy making noise or something, you didn't hear the phone, you, you didn't get a call, of course, eh? And, and they were used to always have the, by uh, <clears throat> toys and stuff like that, when, the two, when somebody paid, had a fire. Yeah, if they fell down, then they used to have that. Uh, that's nice. Yeah. You were on call because you never knew when that phone was going to ring and it didn't matter if you were sound asleep. When you were on call you had seconds to get yeah. up and alert everyone. They enjoyed, you know, the community part of being involved but also the social part. They had great parties too. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Except the first fireman's ball that I was at, up went the hall, of course, eh? I can still recall that quite. Just got home and he went to bed and all of a sudden the phone's ringing and <laughs> away we go, eh? And uh, nobody prepared. Uh, we got the, uh, the old uh, fire, it wasn't a truck, it was just a uh, a, a wagon with a bunch of hose net on it from Canfor, and that's what we used to fight the fire, which wasn't much, eh? So consequently, we lost pretty well everything. They thought they were just fooling. Everybody got home, you know, um, back then, you could drink and drive. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, party time, right? And no one s expected the hall to get up in flames so you know they all came home after the ball and went to bed and then uh, we got the call fire hall was on fire well i remember the headlines saying after the ball they burned the hall that was something that'll stay with us when i was going down to vancouver why they were bugging me down there about it <laughs> I can recall when uh, Roger St. Dennis and Vern Howes and some of them uh, wanted to make a uh, reproduction of the fire hall burning at the fire, uh, next fireman's ball. And uh, they made this cardboard fire hall and all that such. And uh, Roger had put some lighter fluid on it and lit it in a poof smoke all over and then he grabbed the dry cam extinguisher and 
course, it's all our food was <laughs> What a shamaz, I tell you, we're lucky we didn't burn the ho uh, hotel down, <laughs> but we still had a good supper. Yeah, because when that happened, and now then they did different kind, of, then they had different one afterwards, but at first it was just a shoe about it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, then they had a special because of that, now that they have a new kind of a mm -hmm. fireman's after later. The strategy now, I think, is a lot different uh, than it was then. It was, we didn't have that much then to fight fires with. Eh? The, uh, we had, uh, after the hull burnt, we uh, got a loaner truck from Vancouver Fire Marshal's office, eh? and uh, then we took I bought an old cab over from Dawson, and we put that 5,000 or big tank on the back, and put the old pump that went through the fire. We rebuilt it and uh, used that day as well. So that's what we had. It was a terrible old thing to drive around. I stored them at the my garage for uh, oh gosh until the fire hall was built, eh? I, uh, I know, you know, someone else took over the duties as fire chief, but I believe, I believe he stayed a member the full time they lived in Chatwin and they retired to Penticton in 1974. So from say 58 to 74. Ralph Todd come and asked me in uh, I think it was 64 or something like that, if I would consider taking the fire chief's job. And after a bit of discussion, I that I would in a, on a temporary basis because of the business, eh? I didn't really have the time. And uh, yeah, after Bob McNabb was assistant chief at the time, and uh, I don't know, after but just not even a year, I don't think we decided that we voted Bob McNabb in as chief, and he was much more knowledgeable in, you know, in organizing and so on. So. When they got the first fire truck, you know, that was in fairly good condition. That was a big day for the firemen. And also when they got their first set of uniforms. I have a letter here that I'd like to share with you folks here in Chatwind. Um, it was obviously some, a letter that was very dear to my dad because he had it in a very special spot where he kept his favorite papers. And it's dated April the 4th, 1978, and it's coming from Chatwin, BC. It says, Dear Mr. Sterling, I'll show you this dollar bill too because it kind of relates to the little letter. You were, most, you, you were most likely confused when you opened this letter and found the dollar bill, and even more bewildered when you read who sent it. Evans is my married name. I am Lyle Scholenberg's daughter. Years ago, I went into your Sunset Hardware store to buy a birthday present for my mother. When I went to pay for it, I was five cents short. You were very kind and told me I could pay you back later. Sad to say I never did. I finally found your new address and I hope I have not offended you because you see, now my conscience is clear forever. Please accept my apologies. Sincerely, Mrs. Robert Evans. I was with the first fire department that came and still am with the firemen, but the uh, hospital put me away for a while, but seem to be getting better but joining the fire department is the thing to do eh? and uh, they've got a, a lot of people that have been in the department for a lot of years with a lot of knowledge here that I think we're pretty lucky to have Leo he he uh, puts a lot of time and effort into it eh? and uh, <clears throat> Bob McNabb uh, as well was a very you know, got right out there and got at it. And Brian King, uh, the next chief after Bob, and before Leo, uh, he was another fellow that, that that put a quite a bit of time in. But he enjoyed his time in the fire department, I'm sure. At least it seems so. Eh? Yeah. No, it it's a great uh, get together too, eh? They have a lot of good times. And they do a lot of good good things, eh, for the community. Happy 50th anniversary to all the Chetwin firemen and to the hall. 
Good luck in the future. Uh, I understand that it's the uh, 50th anniversary of the Fireman's Ball here in Shetwin, and on behalf of my mom, uh, Beverly Sterling, she still lives in Penticton, we would just like to extend our congratulations to Chetwin and the fire department on all these fine years of service to the Chetwin area. And uh, Dad would love to be here speaking to you today, but unfortunately, Dad passed on on June 12th of this year. Welcome to the 50th Fire Department, Ball. And uh, welcome to the 50th Annual Fireman's Ball. Well, make sure the fires are out when they go to bed and they've had their party. These are actually the great grandsons of my dad, Norman Sterling. This is Carter Dunn and Nathan Dunn. Hi, guys. Thank you. Special thanks goes to uh, Joe Embry and the Rubagalani family. Uh, we have endless hours of um, tape. They had old, old uh, Super 8, 8 millimeters that we converted um, so that we could use it for some of our projects. This is one of two or three projects where we've used Joe's and the Rubagalani's um, tape. I've had a couple requests by people uh, that are visiting from other places to say a couple of words along the way. Um, it's your turn now, anyone that's visiting, to say a couple of words and say happy 50th anniversary. I think Mr. Borton wished to say a couple of words. Later on, you'll be hearing about the McNobb Award. I haven't won the award very often, but I cannot top what Pat Borton did. We used to store the ambulance in uh, the bay of the uh, uh, fire hall. Pat got into the truck, instead of going forward, went backwards, and he stabbed the ambulance. And we had to push the ambulance off the back ladder because of that situation. And no one has really outdone Pat's wonderful work, and we still love Pat. Thank you, Leo. I just got a couple short stories. When I first moved to Chetwin, I bought a house, and in the hallway was this old-fashioned telephone. So I just thought the owner, the previous owner had left it there, didn't think of it. So I'm downtown having coffee, and a couple of guys said, well, you're going to have to join the fire department. I said, why am I going to have to join the fire department? Well, you have a fire phone. So anyway, they explained the fire phone, and <clears throat> and how our wives answered the phone and they had a system and all worked out. We go down in history as having the only call girls in the fire department. <laughs> we had four of them. And, that, and not only that, we didn't pay for it, which is... <laughs> so, anyway, this system worked for quite a little while. Then we went to a fireman's... Um, competition in Dawson Creek and we're sitting around having a couple of pop of fire put over fire and look around and our four call girls are sitting there having having a pop so we had to do something about that so they went back <clears throat> then we figured we had to do something a little more better than that we looked all over and Sister Minka which is the nun in charge of the hospital said well she'll do it from the hospital because there's someone there 24 hours a day so she would look after the telephones. So anyway, she'll go down in history as being the only nun to replace four call girls. <laughs> One other little story. I used to live west of town, and I was in charge of the bar and getting the booze for the fireman's ball. 
So I'm driving from out of town, and a siren behind me. And this cop car comes up there, and it was uh, Chetland's first female police officer. So she came up, and she said, well, I just stopped you because you got a burnt out tail light. I said, oh, okay. And she looked at my back seat, and I had rum, I had scotch, I had every drink imaginable <laughs> for the fire department. So she says, what are you going to do with that? And I said, well, it's a fire, fireman's ball tonight, and this is all the booze for the fire, fireman's ball. She says, oh. She says, what time does it start? I says, well, the doors open around 6, and, and dinner's around 7, and that. She says, oh, I get off work at 4, I'll be able to make it. And she says, do you have any extra tickets? And I said, yeah, we've got some extra tickets. So she says, that's great. I'm so happy because <clears throat> you firemen have far better balls than what the RCF <laughs> Thank you very much and have a good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, former chief, retired chief, Brian King. Well, this is a, uh, yeah, the only chief. <laughs> Come on, you used to do it. <laughs> Show us your balls, Pat. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm glad that we came. I'm really enjoying myself, and uh, it's sure great to see all the old firemen and all the new ones. I think that uh, it was a necessary evil back in the early days. We, uh, I wasn't here when we burnt the hall down, but uh, I was here when we burnt the hotel down. Uh, I think we burnt an elevator down. We burnt a brand new school down. <clears throat> and in the early days, we had an old truck. It was an old KB5, I think, International. And out there on Teslick's hump out here on the highway, that hump in that highway has been there for all the years that I can remember. And we'd get about five or six guys in the back of that old KB5 coming back from a practice. And we'd get her bouncing and we'd hit Teslick's hump out here and we could get the front wheels off the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that was always uh, the achievement if we could do that. Uh, I'm very honored to have been one of the members of the volunteer fire department. I think that I was just talking to Brad tonight and Brad's went on to be a professional firefighter. I believe that volunteer firefighters are unpaid professionals. I've always believed that. The fire will eat our ass just as fast as it'll eat a professional. So my philosophy in the early days was is try and get the best equipment we could do and the best training we could do and uh, I think it worked out. Bob McNabb was a, a ter terrific organizer. He helped me a lot and I really appreciate it. Leo took over. I had to train somebody. I don't know. <laughs> wonder, but anyway. <clears throat> the other good thing that I noticed in Dawson Creek yesterday when we come through Leo, Leo is they have a white spot now. So you don't have to go to Prince or Vancouver to go to the white spot anymore. You can go just into town and there it is. I do, I do. Oh, you do? Okay. That was Leo and John's hangout before they were married. And uh, I think ours was a dog and suds in Saskatoon. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I really appreciate the invite, Leo. And uh, I wasn't too sure whether I was going to come or not. We put, probably put more miles on the last year than Greyhound. But uh, anyway, I'm enjoying it. And I'm sure glad you had me out, Leo. Thanks very much. That was great hearing all those old memories and also watching that movie. That was a great presentation there, Andy and Becky, that you guys put on from Jet. 
our next presentations that we're coming out with this evening, could I please have uh, Deputy Chief Norris and TO Tony Mackey please up to the podium. We're going to have our attendance award presentations. So what we do is we recognize the people that uh, uh, come out on a regular basis and uh, achieve 70% uh, or better throughout the year. This year the Chetwin Fire Department responded to 80 fires calls and 30 rescue calls. And then of course we have the 52 uh, practices and because of the Christmas season you get two freebies. So that is what comprises of... Uh, of how we achieve the attendance award. So, you know, and we recognize there's a lot of folks in the Chetwin Volunteer Fire Department that are shift workers. And uh, for those people to achieve attendance awards, uh, we also implemented where we have extra fire practices. Uh, Chief Sobalski uh, generously gives up his time to, to uh, have fire practice, uh, practices on the next morning for those people that are shift workers. So that way we get to have more people involved and also uh, we give them the opportunity to get involved in the training that's required to become a good firefighter. Keep yourself out of harm's way. So, I'd like to start calling up folks as soon as Leo gives me some <coughs> names. <laughs> Ernest Spanner, 76%. Leo's organized as usual. Yes, stay up, Ernie. You're photogenic. Yeah. Luke Stewart, ninety-four percent. Dennis Walker, 79%. Stay up there, Lucas. Chris Lorette, 78%. Richard Little, 88%. Dana Wilfer, 77%. Brent Weisgerber, 77%. Randy Walker, 76%. So how does this happen? Leo Sobalski, 111%. Tony Mackey, our training officer, 86%. So how that really happens that Leo does achieve 111%, we really would like to congratulate Jan because I don't know how he is ever at home. I come in at night and in the morning. Laverne Norris, 77% attendance. Congratulations. Um, we custom made these and they look really, really super. We have a person that comes out at assist the fire department and we call on him for critical incident stress. We vet and we talk to him quite frequently. And so we have given him also a cooler bag. It's uh, full of water and apples, the same as everyone else. <laughs> so Pastor Bill, come forward please. He goes hunting. 
too, he also has a cooler. The reason there's water in apples, because uh, I don't know if Pastor Bill would share with us, but uh, there was a time when he could have used him on a hunting trip when he had to spend an extra night out that was not planned for. <laughs> Thank you, yep. Uh, we, uh, we weren't lost, we just couldn't come home. <laughs> so, Chetwin Fire Department Attendance Awards uh, of 2013. So remember those faces, because uh, if you're in the ditch or rolled over or your house is burning down, those are the guys you'll probably be seeing. <clears throat> so on a more serious note, back in April, we had a call to our chief from the Maui Fire Department regarding a propane explosion, which almost uh, killed one of our firefighters. <clears throat> Could we please have uh, Mr. Wilfer please attend the podium? <laughs> this year, I would just like to thank you for taking the burden from the rest of the department <coughs> by achieving the highest participation award in the department, which is the, uh, the McNobb Award. It is true. Now I remember in Hawaii, lighting the barbecue at my brother's uh, hacienda there, and I got a little carried away. I had it turned on for too long, and yeah. Thank you, wife. <laughs> Not the wife, trust me. My brother, then. <laughs> Brent and Laura, can you please come up to the podium? So uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, the generous outpouring of donations we've, re we've received from uh, the community and the business uh, in town and surrounding areas. So just take a moment, there's 10 cards on your tables, go through all them, take a look at the businesses there. There is a lot of them here in town. And yes, they deserve a, a big hand for all of this. Well, Dana and Rick get things, uh, Tim, sorry, get things uh, set up. Uh, what we decided to do, and, and, and I know as you heard tonight, it's been an age old uh, argument, who has bigger balls, the RCMP or the firemen. We decided to uh, have a friendly competition between uh, the RCMP and some of the firemen tonight. And to give them a chance, we decided we'd utilize our rookies. So I'd like Jeff, Chris, and uh, Dick to come up, please. And I'd like Ryan Lehman and Mike Zenner to come up, please. Woo! Sorry, Zen. Six or five? So what we're going to do here is we're going to have a nail pounding competition. And uh, because firemen utilize axes and stuff uh, for fighting fire and things like that, we thought that uh, that's what we'd use to pound the nails in with. So the object of this is to pound the nail in with the axe and whoever gets it in the quickest wins. And so to assist these gentlemen, I'd like their, uh, their better halves to come on up also. <laughs> 
I'm sure they're all used to um, hearing lots of comments from them, so maybe they can guide them to, to pound these nails in. So again, because the fire department is used to using, utilizing axes and stuff to give the RCMP a little bit of an advantage, we're going to blindfold everybody. <laughs> and because we want you to know while you're blindfolded where the, the stump is, I'd like you all to take your shoes off, please. <laughs> yeah, we want you to become one with the log, right? We want you to know exactly where it's at. <laughs> so make sure that you get that stump close to you. We want you to put your feet around the bottom of it. And you know, to really feel the stump and become one with it, we also want you to take your socks off. <laughs> And, and get your feet right close to it and, and get it in there so you know where that is because we don't want no one hitting himself with the axe. No, we're not using the back of the axe, guys. We're using the blade. Okay, so before we start, I'd like you all to kind of line up exactly where you want it before we blindfold and get a good feel. And, and strike, the, strike the nail a couple times just to kind of get the idea because you are getting blindfolded. Okay, stop, Dick. That's pretty good. <laughs> you're going to split the log, man. <laughs> Jeff, your toes aren't curled enough there. Is that better? Okay. Make sure it's tight. Make sure it's tight. We don't want no one cheating here. You can't see. You want me to fuck it? No, no, no. His head's too small. Okay, I want you all to hold your axes really still. I don't want you to move it. I want no cheating here. And, and uh, give me a couple minutes here to do a count. You, you're all pretty steady there. That's a good thing. We're going to get started here. I'm going to start counting down here. When I hit one, I want you to start chopping. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Swing harder if you want to hit them. You got to hit them way harder. Come on, Chris, hit it harder. It's a big nail. Come on, Chris. I'd really like to thank you all for participating. Thanks, guys. We have a big round for them. And uh, for participating, you'll all be uh, privileged to collect uh, your favorite pop-up at the bar there. And you'll get a bill for the new socks, by the way. <laughs> Fire department budget can't handle that. What a waste to do that. Oh, right, you guys didn't even hear that. Yeah, you had to have all the socks that were made. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> 
Oh, thanks, guys. I got a headache laughing so hard. Look at that. Good job, fellas. So after the guys get this cleaned up, uh, we can have Chief Leo come up to the podium and we'll be delivering our annual Firefighter of the Year Award. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'll give you a couple minutes to uh, quiet down. In the audience here, we have a former firefighter member, fireman of the year, and um, it's a very prestigious position. Many of the people that have come from out of town and in town that were former firefighters were firemen of the year, and we'll be putting the plaque on. I'll just read some of the names. Uh, um, Brian King, Terry Buker, Gordon Car Carlisle, who's this fellow? Ron Keller, Ron, <laughs> Vern Taylor, Mark Folster, Randy Walker, Kelly Tricker, Doug Woods, Brian King again, Barry Kelm, uh, Morris uh, Barrett, Ed Martin, Bill Rand, Keith Wilson, Rick Lazarco, George Carlton, Al Tricker, um, Ernest Fanner, Brent Weisgerber, Dana Wilfer, Luke Stewart, Richard Little, Derek Hall, Gordy Galbraith, Leo Sabalski, Doug Fleming, Brad Smith, and Dennis Walker, George Nagley, Laverne Norris, and did I miss anyone? Bernie LeBlanc. I think I've got everyone. Leo Yep, Leo's gone there. Yep. So we, we have a lot of people here, and we have a tradition, and uh, the person that is the recipient of the 2013 Firefighter of the Year, has been in the fire department for 23 years. He's held many, many positions. He's always there to help, no matter what time of hour, late, early in the morning, he's always there. He's been in charge of the warehouse, and even though he's grumpy, we don't care. <laughs> And um, it's our pleasure to present the person who ended up putting together the Make-A-Wish house for a little kid this year and has been always there for us. His name is George Nagley and can I come forward? George Nalia, George Nalia, and the wife Diane. George Nalia, the wife Diane. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I got a 76 page speech ready. <laughs> apparently, this, apparently, this is what happens when they catch you doing good things. <laughs> So apparently I was caught doing nice things for somebody who really needed it, among other things. I've been pretty active in the fire department anytime they need a hand. One of our pride and joys was the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I was asked if I would spearhead that, and I was glad I did. There's a little boy named Chase who has a wonderful present now, and he's enjoying it immensely. Thank you. And he has uh, another clock. He got one. He, uh, George has recently retired from the province of British Columbia with 40 years service. So you have two clocks. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. George. Malia and Diane. And uh, George, there's one more tradition, and the hose bed's all made up for you.
because so many uh, firefighters have come from far and away, uh, any other person whose visit wishes to make a short speech? Ron, do you want to say hello to the chief? You know what might be nice is, uh, can we have all the former members of the Chubman Fire Department and the present members for one big photo op? Come on up. Ron, you want to do a few words too? Yeah. George, you couldn't have been better. You're the best. We're sure proud of you. After all the years. Just something I want to <clears throat> say tonight. A number of years ago when we were in it, we used to get fires the spring of the year, always by the airport. Well, this one night we had a fire call, and here were these little native kids setting the fires. So we put the fire out, run these little suckers off, and <laughs> we get back to the ball, back to the hall, or rather, <laughs> have a beer going, and there'd be another call. That happened three times one night. We made nothing but money. <laughs> All it cost us was 20 bucks. <laughs> Actually, you know, we didn't pay any of them. Of it. But it was great. But really, you know, we go back and we go by and leave this with a lot of fond memories. A lot of people here that we knew over the 25 years that we lived here. And it's an awesome place. We still come by here and we still, this is going home again. And it's, it's not home anymore, but boy, we sure have a lot of dear friends here that we remember from years ago. And some of them, the acquaintances were, were renewed again tonight. And that's pretty darned awesome. We congratulate you. Come on up, uh, all present members, past members, so that we can all get together and uh, give each other a hug. Come on up. George, Melia, I'm sorry for... I'm reading those names out. Thinking the wrong word. Hey, hey, hey. Hooray! One, two, three. Hooray! Hail the chief! Hail the chief! Hail the asshole! Hello, chief! <laughs>
Chase is, um, was diagnosed early, early, early 2011 with a Wilms tumor, and he's been uh, treated for cancer down at the uh, BC Children's Hospital, and he's he's come up clear. Uh, it's been well over a year now, and uh, the um, Make a Wish Foundation has uh, supplied a uh, a uh, play center for the for Chase, and the uh, local fire department has been gracious to set it up or Grandpa would have had to set it up. <laughs> Hi, my name's George Malley. I'm with the Chetwin Fire Department and we're here this morning putting together a jungle gym set for Chase Curiata. I'm Dennis Walker with the Chetwin Fire Department and we're putting a play thing together for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I feel uh, great. It's for a child and it's what more is there to do? Hi, my name's Tolly Mackey. Uh, I'm here today to help uh, a child with a wish to, for a playground with a let's make a wish deal. It's beyond belief the the stuff that you don't have to do when you have a, a child that's really sick. There's 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 many hands that are helping out uh, financially, uh, uh, labor in a case like this, and um, and just moral support and prayers. It's it, it's it's quite amazing what happens. Chase doesn't have a clue what's going on here, and uh, he's gonna he's gonna wet himself when he <laughs> when he sees the fire truck and then and then the the, the play play center in the backyard. Like your new house? Did. Do you? What do you like about it? It's super thin. Pardon me? It's super thin. Awesome. And you're going to play in this all the time, right? Yeah. Mom and Dad are going to be coming out here all day wondering where you are and you're going to be right here. Yeah. How does your sister like it? Good. Good? Yeah. Do you want to thank anyone? Mm -hmm. Thank you for making this. Well, we started at 9 o'clock this morning. And it's about 3 o'clock now, so that's been a good six hours or so. Oh, that, yes. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about making this uh, wish come true? It's been fun so far. The three of us have been working good together and had some good jokes going around, and hopefully we can finish before it uh, gets dark. Mel, you're Chase's granddad. Mm -hmm. Your reaction when you walked in, was it priceless? No, oh, it was. Yeah. He, he was uh, he's not very often um, short of words, but he was he was short today. Yeah, he was speechless. What do you want to say to all the volunteers, Make-A-Wish Foundation? Thank you very much. It's just uh, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Well, today a wish came true for Chase. The Make-A-Wish Foundation and firemen helped build this house for Chase. We want to wish Chase all the best, all the best to his family. And thank you to Make-A-Wish Foundation. Thank you to the firemen. Thank you to everyone who was involved. I'm sure Chase is going to love his new house. For Chet TV, I'm Joanne Lohr. Thank, thank you, Make-A-Wish. Make